Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, free site, bettingangle.us, free site. Let's talk boxing. Let's talk the Charlo brothers. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now first let me say congratulations to anyone who followed the betting advice for the Tony Harrison Jermel Charlo fight. Right? Tony Harrison, 7 to 1 underdog, delivered for us. Even giving away some of the 7 to 1 as part of a hedge should still have netted you at least, what, three to four times your money on the play. Right now, let me just say this. It's a story as old as boxing. Don't focus too much on the fighters themselves. What I want you to do is to actually focus on the situation because it's going to present itself time and time again. This shows up repeatedly in boxing in different weight classes, right? One of the guys is technical, but has a flat affect. In other words, as you watch him on film, he doesn't leap out at you, right? He's more interested in landing clean shots than he is looking explosive. Fighters like this tend to be pot shotters, right? I believe for them, they're seeing windows of opportunity. In other words, they know if he does this, I'm going to have a window of opportunity to counter. Right? And when they fight guys who are better athletes, who look more explosive, but who don't have the same technical skills to stay deep in the pocket, but who have charisma to bring the crowd in the ring with them, what you're going to have is a situation where the more technical, counter-punching, pot-shotting fighter is going to be the underdog, right? Is going to be undervalued by casinos. We had a series of these fights. Juan Manuel Marquez versus Manny Pacquiao. Right? As I've said here many times online, many times online, I have yet to see the Juan Manuel Marquez Manny Pacquiao fight that Marquez lost. In other words, I thought Marquez first fight, you could call that a draw. In fact, they did. The other three, Marquez wins them. The first fight, quite frankly, I thought Marquez starts to dominate that fight after a very rough beginning where he's on the canvas several times. Right? You can plug in different names. Pernell Whitaker knows what I'm talking about. He pitched a masterpiece against one man, excuse me, Julio Cesar Chavez. Right? Sonny Vaccaro, a Vegas odds maker thought Purnell won almost every round of that fight. They call that fight a draw. Then Purnell Whitaker fought Oscar De La Hoya years later. Folks, that's a masterpiece defensive fight. Oscar couldn't find Purnell. Ask Oscar today who the best defensive fighter he's faced was, and he'd tell you Purnell Whitaker. Now, understand the risk involved, though. The judges in that fight gave it to Oscar. You have a fight on the card here that we're discussing. On the Tony Harrison, Jamel Charlo card, where the underdog got ripped off. We'll talk about that fight. Right? The point I'm making to you is, as you look at these fights, where someone's highly technical, is repeatedly landing counters. I believe guys like Marquez, guys like Tony Harrison, who's landing the left with regularity, right, with regularity. I believe they truly believe that the opponent is so flawed. In other words, these are deconstructionists. The word technician is overused in boxing. There are very few of them. 
These guys are technicians. They know that there are moments in the sequence where their opponents, whether it's Manny Pacquiao, whether it's Jermel Charlo, are completely defenseless. So let me say this. I understand there's controversy on the fight. I understand on Fox, Lennox Lewis, who was doing the fight, couldn't understand the decision. I understand Larry Hazard Sr., who was scoring the fight, had Jermel Charlo up 117-110 or 111, something like that, wide margin. Chris Myers was dumbfounded by the decision, right? I understand you're going to have a group like that. Whenever you have a technical low affect, in other words, not a lot of emotion. Think about Juan Manuel Marquez's emotional range. In fact, think about Floyd Mayweather. Right? The knock on Mayweather was that fans would get bored watching his fights. You know, these fighters don't get the benefit of the doubt a lot. Mayweather was just so dominant, landing over 50% of his punches, that the judges couldn't rob him. Right? But understand, it's a pattern in boxing. For gamblers, you need to be aware of the pattern. Because when a guy like a Juan Manuel Marquez fights a Manny Pacquiao, or whereas here, you have a Tony Harrison who actually has a car crash tape. One where he's knocked flat by Jared Hurd. When you have a technical guy who, you know, is pot-shotting and is you know, setting things up and is patient. All of these guys are very patient. All of these technician guys, watch their eyes. They're looking at you. They're reading you like a newspaper. I'm just telling you, fighters like that don't conjure up a lot of excitement. We, the fans, like to see the guy jumping in with the big shots. The guy who has extra energy. Some will consider it extra energy. Others will consider it wasted energy. I believe a Jermel Charlo translates better at the arena than he does on TV. At the arena, you're sitting in your seat. You don't really have all the angles of the person at home. You see a guy who's energetic who's jumping in, who's winding up, who's throwing big punches. At least they look big. Understand, Jamel Charlo's KO percentage is less than 50%. Right? But the punches look big. Looks like he's pushing the action. Looks like he's the one trying to corner Tony Harrison, who's just sitting back, throwing a counter hook, sitting back, throwing a counter jab, right? There are times in the fight where it looks like Jamel Charlo is opening up. You notice Tony Harrison is just bouncing like this, has his back up against the rope. At home, you have the benefit of replay. At the arena, Depending on where you're sitting, you might be looking at the back of Jermel Charlo. It looks dramatic. You're cheering. He's taking you in the ring with him, right? He's throwing a lot of punches. On TV, you're noticing that very few of those punches are landing. Worse yet, you're noticing, and this is a technician thing, Floyd, Marquez, Tony Harrison, you'll notice Tony has a hand up. You'll notice that as the punch comes, he's turning away. You'll notice that he's catching some of the shots. Right? In other words, he's defending himself. Worse yet, you'll notice at the end of the barrage, as Charlo backs up, Tony's ready to throw a counter. Tony's hitting Charlo at the beginning of the onslaught and at the end of the onslaught. Now I know this is not the way 
it was announced on Fox Live. I understand the crowd booed at the arena when they entered the decision. I understand that Jermel, excuse me, Jermel Charlo's skills are more photogenic. Right? He's all body. He jumps in. He's, you know, you see him throwing a punch from here and stuff like that. A guy who throws a punch from here looks more exciting than a guy who's just timing a shot. Who then just extends and lands a stiff counter jab. Right? Let me just say this. And I encourage everyone to look closely at the fight. The fighter with the better defense is Tony Harrison. Jamel Charlo is coming forward on his front foot. The guy who has the back foot game, who's actually able to operate from all over the ring, the middle of the ring, the side of the ring. The guy who's landing the cleanest shots. The guy who, let's be blunt, has the better jab. The guy who has the better timing is Tony Harrison. Take away all the extra bounce and movement and energy of Jamel Charlo. And look at the actual punches landed. I'm just telling you, Jamel Charlo had a harder time landing clean shots than did Tony Harrison. Folks, several times. Charlo jumps in and is hit flush. Doesn't have a hand up. He's the one coming forward. He's the one getting charged for the real estate. Right? So, I know people are upset. I get it. Charlo, no question about it, fought the more entertaining, fan-friendly fight. He looked like he was doing more. I want everyone here to revisit the tape. Folks, the guy who was doing more was the pot shotter, Tony Harrison, who's interesting. They asked Jared Hurd, who stopped Tony, right? Tony's only been stopped twice, Willie Nelson and Jared Hurd. What he thought about this fight. And he said, look, if Charlo doesn't take care of Harrison early, he's going to have problems late in this fight if Tony still has a tank of gas. Now understand, Tony, and this will shock some people, I believe Tony Harrison has faster hands than Jamel Charlo, right? Just look at the first six rounds of his fight against Jared Hurd, where he's dominating Jared Hurd, right? Has the better combination, lets his hands go. Understand, this is a different Tony Harrison. This is the fighter who has hand speed, who has dialed back his hand speed, literally dialed it back to give himself more stamina and to land the clean shots because the opportunity to hit Jamel Charlo, who's trying to load up on shots, is that obvious to Harrison? Right? I believe Harrison went in thinking, hey, I can catch this guy just like Juan Manuel Marquez caught Manny Pacquiao naked jumping in. Because the energetic fighter, right, who's jumping in, who's looking flashy, who's, you know, flurrying, leaves himself open for counters. So Harrison here fights a different fight than he thought that than he fought against Jared Hurd. Right? Jared Hurd's a guy who collapses the pocket, who overwhelms you with volume and pressure. 
right? Here you had sporadic. Jamel Charlo trying to load up on shots to get a knockout. The problem was that, again, he had the inferior jab, right? Tony Harrison was the better jabber. He had the inferior counter-punching skills. Tony Harrison is the better counter-puncher. He couldn't operate backing up. Tony Harrison had the better back foot game. Right? I'll agree. Tony gets caught at times. But Tony had the better defense. Right? CompuBox doesn't quite enable you to fully appreciate the degree to which a punch has been blocked. If I have a hand up and I'm rolling away and you're able to bounce a shot off my hand and hit my chin as I'm moving away, that counts as a landed punch. But that's not as devastating as one where I'm jumping in like this, thinking I'm going to be able to land a right hand and you throw a straight left that hits my face flush. Those are the shots Jamel Charlo got hit with. Let me applaud the judges who had Harrison winning this fight. Just from a straight boxing perspective, if you strip away all the excess movement, right, Charlo jumping around the ring and, you know, being energetic. Take away the gymnastics show. And Charlo got outboxed. In my opinion, you earned, you earned the big return, the seven to one odds that you got on this fight. Now let's talk about a fight that truly upset me. Right? This fight really upset me. On the same card, Al Heyman has a hell of a middleweight. There's no question about it. Right? This guy is viable. And by viable, I mean take a note of his name because if he fights Danny Jacobs, dare I say, if he fights Saul Alvarez, this guy's going to be a live underdog. And that's Matt Karaboff, who, as I see it, Box the socks off of Jamal Charlo. Folks, the skill gap is obvious. For, let's say, the first seven rounds of the fight. Then the fact that Karabov had been inactive for a while. Right? The fact that Karabov was scheduled to fight a shorter fight at a different weight. He, he was supposed to fight at 162. And he got notice that he was fighting Jamal Charlo less than a week ago, right? Willie Nelson messed up on a drug test. So this late replacement comes in, and oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. He gives us one of the best performances of the year. Right, folks, he makes unbeaten Jamal Charlo look amateur, surely. Understand, the punch of this fight is Matt Karabov's straight left. That's the punch of this fight. Right, and Karabov can throw it. Karabov's a southpaw. He can throw that punch as a lead. In other words, there are times where the guys are just looking at each other and Karabov just hits Charlo in the mouth. Right? Just no jab in front of it. Karabov doesn't throw a lot of jabs. He just leads with his dominant hand, just hits Charlo in the mouth with a straight right hand. Oh, excuse me, a straight left hand. Then there are times where he counters. Charlo comes in, understand how much the skill gap is. Karabov moves above the waist, right? Karabov is also 
three-dimensional. He has a high-low game, kind of like Pernell Whitaker. There are times where he just bends his knees and he gets low. So he's mobile up top. So Charlo comes in, throws punches often. Karabov would duck under the punches, then come back with that straight left. By contrast, Charlo is upright. Can't really bend. Understand, Karabov is front foot or back foot, in addition to being three-dimensional. So Karabov is able to just back up, doesn't matter where he is. By contrast, Charlo is front foot heavy. One of the problems with the Charlo brothers, quite frankly, is that these guys need to be high energy and offensive. They can't fight a low volume, slow round. They need to come after you. They don't have the skills to stay away from you and win the round. So Karabakh figures out that really all Jamal Charlo can do against him, Charlo looked lost against Southpaws, is jump in with a one-two. Sakharabov so starts playing games with distance. Let me say this too. Karabov has a great straight left hand and a good straight right hand to the body. Right? Just like Floyd Mayweather. Karabov can just dip a shoulder, get low, throw the straight shot to the body. He doesn't have to hook you to the body. I'm just telling you for the first half of this fight, Jamal Charlo can't find Karabov's body. Now I'm embarrassed. That's the word. I'm embarrassed for the judges. The scoring's an outrage. It's comical. Let me also say too, Larry Hazard Sr., the resident scorer on Fox, he's awful, right? If you thought Harold Letterman of HBO got ahead of himself, Harold Letterman's a master compared to Larry Hazard. I don't know what Larry's going off of. Is he going at, off of crowd volume and stuff like that? Because there's no way he's going off of clean punches landed. Who is dictating the tempo of the fight? Think about it. You're watching a Jamal Charlo fight. He's on national TV here in the United States. The fight's taking place in New York City. Big venue. Big chance to impress. He's fighting a late replacement who has been relatively inactive. Karabov got a shot at the title. In 2014, he hasn't even been fighting the elites of late, right? I'm telling you that Karabov has Charlo so confused that the pace of the fight, a fight where you would expect Charlo to come in with a lot of energy, feed off the crowd, be active, be high volume, folks, like a Floyd Mayweather fight, the volume dives here. You know why the volume dies? Because Karabov is controlling the pace of the fight. He has Charlo missing so much that Charlo reaches a point where he's afraid to throw his jab. Folks, that's how wide the fight is. Now Fox tries to rehabilitate Charlo. In the face of a fight where Karabov is landing power shots, Fox, for some odd reason here, keeps showing you the jab count. Message to Fox, Karabov's not throwing jabs. Why does he have to throw jabs when he's landing power shots? Right? So I'll just say this. Officially, officially, Jamal Charlo won the fight. He certainly had a whale of a 12th round, and that came after a very good 11th round. I'll say Charlo 
finish the fight strongly. Now that might be in part because Karabov wasn't even training for a 12-round fight. That might be in part because Karabov was supposed to fight a fight at 162. This fight was at 160 and he had to lose those last two rounds. And anyone on a diet knows the hardest pounds to lose are the last pounds. But make no mistake, and I know the people on Fox had it differently. Lennox Lewis, uh, everyone had Karabov starting quickly. Everyone. <laughs> right? Uh, by the way, I have no idea how Larry Hazard Sr. gave the first round to Charlo. That's, that's a bit questionable to me. Right? But even Larry Hazard Sr. had Karabov winning the second, third, and fourth round. Right? There's no doubt Karabov is up at the halfway point of this fight. Let me just say, I had Karabov winning this fight by at least three rounds. I had Karabov winning the first seven rounds of the fight. Certainly, without question, the first six rounds of the fight. If I'm Al Heyman, I have to realize that Karabov is the best middleweight that I have. Right? If I'm Saul Alvarez, a guy who just destroyed Rocky Fielding with body shots, a guy who collapsed the pocket against Golovkin, and let's be fair to Canelo, Golovkin looks like he's wincing at the end of that rematch off some body shots. If I'm Canelo, I would have to look at this tape closely and ask myself the question as to why Charlo was unable to land meaningful body shots on Karabov, right? Karabov is exactly the kind of fighter who hides his body and who makes you pay that would give Saul Alvarez a hard time, right? Karabov calls himself the most avoided man at middleweight. After looking at this fight, which proved to me that he's better than Jamal Charlo, and I know that's not what the public's thinking. Understand, my audience are gamblers. I'm just telling you, this is a location fight. This is a possession fight. If the guy with all the height behind him entering the ring was Matt Karabov, Karabov would have won this fight by three or four rounds. The fight wouldn't even be that noteworthy except for the 12th round where Karabov is hanging on for dear life, right? He does get caught twice, right? He seems to be taking a page out of the Tyson Fury playbook. Hang around the guy. <laughs> Hang around the guy in a fight you've won, right? The scoring, abysmal. Nobody watching this video should believe any of the judges' scorecards in this fight. They're terrible. Just know the people around Jamal Charlo have to realize, I believe the fighter himself realizes, that Matt Karabov just exposed a part of Charlo's game as limited. Right? Charlo at times is missing punches by this much, folks. Charlo does make adjustments late. He does start to block some of the straight lefts, right? I'm guessing Karabov, should a rematch happen, will start to throw left hooks instead of the straight left. But make no mistake, Karabov, different skill level right now than Jamal Charlo, right? Charlo can't fight low. Charlo doesn't have Karabov's back foot game. Charlo, like his brother, doesn't have Karabov's counterpunching skills. Right? Charlo looks like the better athlete, bounces around, has more energy, brings the crowd with him into the ring. Right? But let's just say Charlo's combination punching got taken away from him by a superior fighter. Right, so to sum up, oh, let me add the caveat. 
right? And it is a caveat you need to know about. Korobov, the better technician with the flatter affect. In other words, he's not throwing bolo punches and stuff like that. It's meat and potatoes with pot shotting tech technical types. Right? Karabov went off as a nine to one underdog. Nine to one. I'm just telling you here, right? I had him winning the fight by at least three rounds. I know none of the judges did. Okay, fair enough. I'm just telling you, when you pick flat affect, meat and potatoes, highly technical guys who are just trying to take advantage of windows. Again, Juan Manuel Marquez is fighting Manny Pacquiao. He knows when Pacquiao jumps in, he has an open window. Right? He knows it. In fact, he drops Pacquiao twice in that last fight. Right? He knows it. Guys like that tend to be undervalued by casinos. We're going to see this pattern emerge in other fights. Now that the world has seen Matt Karabov, I understand. The folks who haven't seen the fight, they think Karabov lost this by unanimous decision. The folks who have seen the fight, especially those who watch boxing a lot, understand that Karabov, a guy who beat Alexander Usyk in the amateurs, a guy who had a decorated <laughs> amateur career, a guy who was holding his own against Andy Lee before Andy Lee, a puncher, got off a big punch on him and the ref stopped the fight. Karabov, <laughs> Karabov loses that fight on his feet. Understand, this is the first time Karabov, and we'll put it in quotes, has lost to a right-handed fighter. If you're a gambler, you need to keep an eye on guys like this. You need to keep an eye on guys like Tony Harrison. These are the kind of guys who can pull the big upsets because the fans don't come in the ring with them. They're not as photogenic in their skill set as, let's say, a Charlo or a Manny Pacquiao, right? So to close, the takeaway from this video, I hope, is to keep an eye on Tony Harrison and it's to keep an eye on Matt Karabov. Trust me, Tony Harrison will never be a seven to one underdog against Jamel Charlo ever again. Right? Nor will Matt Karabov be a nine to one underdog to any contender at middleweight. Quite frankly, if he signs to fight anyone at middleweight, anyone, Golovkin, anyone, right? If they're giving you huge odds, you need to have at least some of that bet on him. You can hedge the play with Golovkin by KO. You can hedge the play with Canelo by KO. You can hedge the play with Danny Jacobs by KO. Right? But just understand, if the casino is going to undervalue a guy of this caliber this much, some of your bet has to be with this fighter. Congratulations on hitting the 7-1 to one on Tony Harrison. We'll continue to try to find fights that present situations where we can get huge odds. Thanks for stopping by.